Welcome to the last episode of week two of Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am pleased and honored to have our guest on to the show today. She is one year into her first term as city councillor for the city of Airdrie. I'm looking forward to talking about herself, her community, and of course, tourist destinations in her community as well. Please welcome Councillor Heather Spearman to the show. Councillor, welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Thank you, Chris. I should say, like, thank you for having me on Cross Border Interviews with, like, the good Chris Brown. So exciting that you're here and having, um, I'm just, I'm so jazzed that you are giving a platform to not only um, municipal politicians, but a lot of women. And it is Women's History Month. So double whammy on that, that awesome, awesome foresight that you had. When you told me about that, because I will be honest, it would, did not cross my mind when I started doing a uh, municipal month. I went and I count it and we have majority of our guests for this month are women. So there you go. We are promoting women in politics as well, as well as municipal governments. Um, but Let's start this interview because I'm looking forward to it, as I said, and if you've listened to the episodes prior to this, you know what the first question is going to be, and that is, Councillor Spearman, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, man, let me try and be as concise as possible. Not or don't. Point. You can be as long. <laughs> you can. It's a very long interview, so you take as much time as you need. You know, um, there's a lot, a lot of aspects to where my kind of, I call it a servant's heart. And I, and I call it that because I really love when I see it in other people. Um, and it really is what it is. Like, that's the thing that gets you out of bed in, in the morning. And that's the last thing you think about at night. And uh, obviously my family fits into that and they're a big part of everything I do as well. But um, when it comes to serving my community, I grew up in a family of politics that's what we talked about at the dinner table that's what we um, debated at times um, sometimes to a to a fault and I realized that that was such a privilege to grow up in that because well, we can get into it later but I, I just found it such a privilege especially as I entered my own campaign for the first time and realized how little people know about politics in Alberta and in Airdrie and particularly around municipal politics. So I definitely owe my sense of duty to serve to my parents. Obviously my dad being in politics was a big part of that, but my mom, um, she has to this day, all she does is serve, serve, serve to a fault, I would say sometimes. Um, so my parents definitely played uh, an incredible part of that. The friends that I've surrounded myself throughout my whole life have been a huge part of that. Just really good people. And they're just, we all kind of magnetize towards each other. So I'm, I'm grateful to my friends for that. And, and my husband and his family are really like great servants as well. Um, and then just, you know, you go through hard times in life and that does one of two things and you know there's a bit of a I don't know if it's a parable so much as a an anecdote where you know you have a parent who's an alcoholic and twin sons who are raised and one of them becomes an alcoholic and one of them becomes like a really wonderful advocate for helping people with mental health disease um and when you ask both those sons, why are you like this now? They both say, well, it's because my dad was an alcoholic. And so you, you hit these challenges and these obstacles in your life and you kind of hit a fork in the road and you go, am I going to use this to change the world? Or am I going to use this to make excuses to um, not do things? And, and I don't want to reduce, you know, anybody's challenges in their life because it's not an, ex it's definitely not an excuse. I shouldn't say it that way, but um I, I hit a precipice as a very young adult, late teen, where I hit some really huge challenges in my life and I had to decide how I was going to live my life going forward. And that's really, I mean, that was the tipping point for me. And that's how I eventually got to where I am now. I have been doing this, this show for over 454 episodes. This is our 455th episode as of recording this right now. Counselor, that is the most um, down to earth, uh, most honest response to that question I've ever gotten. Um, <laughs> and I thank you for opening up about that. 
I know uh, for myself, uh, my duty to give back came from my uh, struggles with my cancer when I was diagnosed in 2020, my struggles with alcohol as well. And I can tell you, you have just, I, I'm more looking forward to this interview than I have ever looked forward to an interview in a very long time. So thank you for being honest and open about that. And you have given me so many questions that I want to follow up on. And I know we have a certain amount of time, so I'm going to try and do this as quick as possible. Um, you mentioned your father was in politics. I try not to do a lot of research on my guests because I want to learn from my guest. Who's your yeah. father? Uh, so my dad's Chris Spearman. He was the mayor of Lethbridge for eight years. And prior to that, he spent about 25 years on the local school division. So you, you, you municipal politics runs in your blood is what you're saying, because I did not know that. <laughs> I Yet again, I'm relatively new to uh, Alberta. So my knowledge yeah. of municipal politics, like you said, most people don't really follow municipal politics. And that's why I'm trying to expand on this series. But was municipal politics always something that you wanted to get into seeing what your father went through? Uh, that's a great question. I'm going to start with this. I want to touch on something you said, you know, you said I'm new to Alberta, you know, haven't really gotten into municipal politics. I don't want to sound offside here, but municipal politics is sexy as hell. I love it. Like I love it. And I'm not saying that because my dad was in it and that's what I always thought I wanted to do. In fact, I wasn't even living at home when he first ran for mayor. Um, I was always a part of his campaigns. I saw the mess. I saw the people, the dark side of it. Um, and, you know, and it definitely didn't, you know, inspire me to get into municipal politics from that angle, but it prepared me to be, you know, ready for some of the things that would happen. Um, but I will say, the tipping point for me to get into municipal politics was during the pandemic. And I have been, I have a women's support group that I run online. It's got like 8,100 members. Um, and that's something I've been running for like six or seven years, I think now, maybe longer. I don't know what year it is anymore, but um, you know, I, so I've always been someone who wanted to bring the community together. And honestly, I have been so frustrated as a mother, as a person who works a full-time job, as someone with multiple disabilities, as a woman, um, and as a supporter of arts and culture, uh, and someone who is on a journey of learning more about, you know, Indigenous affairs and, you know, um, obstacles that present themselves for, for, you know, people of different minorities. And, and I was so frustrated with our province and I was having a night and I was having a glass of wine and I text my dad and he was still mayor at the time. And I was like, ah, I am so sick of this. I was like, how do I run for an MLA position? I got to do this. Like the next election is going to be on like this, this coming, uh, well, it wasn't this coming year. It was going to be uh, 2023. I knew that was coming. I was like, I got to start now. And he's like, oh, Heather, no, <laughs> you will hate it. <laughs> he's like, you will not enjoy it it's really slow. You're not going to get where you want to go with it. He's like, think about municipal politics. Uh, so I did. And, and honestly, that, that conversation with him was the tipping point. I was so angry. Um, and I realized like, I am totally aware of everything in municipal politics that it should be, and it shouldn't be. Uh, and a lot of people have given me the advice to stay in my own lane, but we are at a point, at least in Airdrie, where that, that, tagline staying in your own lane it can't exist anymore because things aren't getting done that need to get done citizens are coming to the city to say why don't we have this why don't we have that why is this happening and we are the ones who are getting totally inundated because people aren't feeling heard and so we are at a point now where we can't stay in our lane and as a municipal politician I find that I am somehow involved in yelling about policies that technically shouldn't be in our realm, but here we are. It's part of our strategic priorities. Um, you know, advocacy to other levels of government ended up being something that I was pushing like a maniac in our conversations in January to have added on there because I just can't sit by idly and be a representative of the people and not say something when our province is on fire, metaphorically and sometimes literally. So 
Um, I, I'm going to love this conversation so much more now because <laughs> you, 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 you are the queen of segues because you're bringing up things that I want to talk about later on, but I'm going to talk about, I'm going to stay on my line of questions and I'm going to bring, go uh, do a call back to this conversation here. <laughs> I want to talk about that 2021 election. And I want to, yeah. because you talked about how your father was the sort of the catalyst of getting involved in running uh, municipally, but was there an issue? Was there an issue in Airdrie that you said, okay, it needs to be fixed. And I believe my voice at that council table is the voice that needs to be there to fix this issue. Or was it you needed to get involved because, as you said, you wanted to change the world? Hmm. So it was, I'm not a, I obviously wasn't like a single issue candidate, but for me, there was a few things that kind of contributed to my platform and the way I ran my campaign. One was engagement in politics in Airdrie. And I don't mean politics like, hey, we love talking about politics. I'm talking like just integration in your day-to-day -day life about giving a crap about what's going on in your city and your province. The engagement level is is embarrassingly low. It's really bad. Why do you think um, that is? Why do you think that is? Because you're not the first councillor or mayor or elected official who has said engagement in municipal politics is at an all-time low. People care about provincial politics. They care about federal politics, especially if their team wins or loses. But municipally, as the frontline politics, it's not there. Why do you think that is such a big, why do you, why do you think uh, residents are so apathetic when it comes to politics on a municipal level? You know, I, I can't speak for other municipalities, but I'll say in Airdrie here, here's where my thought line comes from. And this is totally just my gut check on this. Not, I have no data to back this up really. Um, we have a very young city. Our average age in Airdrie is 33 years old. Two thirds of our population are families, young families. So ha um, have kids under the age of 19 living in the home. Uh, so we're young and A, you know what it's like to be in the trenches in your 20s and 30s. And you're just trying to get your kids from point A to point B. You're barely sleeping through the night. It's not a priority because A, people are busy and B, there is not enough education or engagement coming to the citizens. And that has been my war cry since the start is I'm going to educate you. I'm going to tell you what it's like to be a counselor. I'm going to tell you why you need to care. And I'm going to talk to you about things that matter to you. So through my campaign, it was politics 101. It was here's the difference between what you're voting for um, from municipal politics versus provincial versus federal. And it was like, we're talking single screenshot Instagram post with like bullet points because most people didn't know. People were getting really upset with the city over things that the city had no control over. Why don't we have more ambulances in energy? Well, that's a provincial program. That's a provincial decision. And we can scream and cry and stomp our feet. Uh, we can buy our own ambulances, but we we are not in charge of that program, right? So, so being um, educational, understanding that not everybody grew up in a home with politics that was a privilege you know when I was getting my nomination form signed to run for counselor one of the people that um I asked to sign my form I showed up at her house and she's a brilliant lady like she's got two degrees she runs her own business she's got three kids like smart as heck but she is exactly who I'm talking about when I say that people are too busy and they don't have the knowledge base or engagement from us when she signed my my paper she finished signing it and she said so like are you the mayor now or does this like how, how many of you get to like like what happens like where's the cut off on the signatures to people not being allowed to sit on city council and I said oh like internally I went shit people really don't know how this works sorry dropping s bombs and whatever else but people really didn't know how th how this works right I mean we haven't been in high school or grade six social studies for 20 30 years some of us so I I said no like you signing this means that I have enough people in energy that believe that I should run to be on city council and then we're going to have an election and I need you to show up and vote for that and I need you to bring all your friends and then that night we'll find out who the top six counselors are and who the mayor is I said but even here in Airdrie, the mayor runs for the mayor seat, counselors run for council seat, 
smaller municipalities, you know, they have all counselors and they direct a reeve or whatever. Like we had to break that down. And, you know, this is a brilliant and funny and wonderful person. It's not her, her fault that she didn't know. It's just that we never talk about it and we never get into the details of how things work at the most basic level. So, you know, if, if, long story short, if you want to know why people aren't engaged, it's because they don't know and we're not doing anything about it to help them. Correct me if I'm wrong here, counselor, but the city of Airdrie elects their counselors at an at-large uh, uh, district, right? They don't elect them as wards that say in Edmonton and Calgary, but in Airdrie, it's basically you're elected on the same level as the mayor and you're elected to represent the whole city. Correct. Yeah, you got yeah. it. I want to turn back to that 2021 election almost a year ago this month. Well, a year ago this month, not to the day, but a year ago this month. Um election night you put your heart and soul into this campaign you have now let the chips fall where they are and you are declared the next councillor elect for the city of airdrie take me through your process of that that night of the emotional roller coaster that you probably were on because when you're going into that i've been on the receiving end of a few elections and I've never had the ability to see that check mark or that elect beside it but I can tell you there are emotions that go through my head what was it like for you going through that night man what a mixed bag <laughs> um I'll tell you COVID really threw a wrench in it because <laughs> obviously I mean we say that about everything that COVID touched when I started to plan for my campaign it was quite a bit sooner than what I really shared with the public like I knew quite a bit in advance uh, that I was going to do this and when I envisioned election night I envisioned like being in um, one of my favorite local pubs and having like everybody that worked on my campaign there and you know celebrating with them in person and like watching the results roll in like that's how I envisioned it um, what it was, was we had a couple of close friends who were like, you know, we're all vaccinated and everybody tested, made sure they were negative, a couple of close friends at home. And then everything was online. So I sat there with my laptop open and we just had like refresh, refresh, refresh to see the polls come in. Um, there was some drama a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, we had a lot of folks that were feeling like they weren't allowed to vote. And I can't remember the exact details, but it was along the lines of people that didn't get vaccinated and felt like they couldn't go in and vote, which was not the case. That was not it. All you had to do was you had to wear a mask. And if you wanted to vote and you were like potentially uh, COVID positive or you had been out of the country or you know something that was like an at-risk uh, detail about who you are or what you were doing in that moment. And I'm not saying this as anti-vax, any, like I'm not saying any of that people made decisions however they needed to in the best uh, interest for themselves and their families. But in that, in that election, what was happening was a lot of the volunteers for that day would get people to fill out their form, like in a sort of more distant location or outside. Um, and that created a bit of a stir. And so there were some issues at a couple of the polling stations. And um, as a result, the results came in quite a bit later for a couple of them. So all that to say, I was sitting there and we're hitting refresh. I'm in this live stream with some of my friends in their homes. And um, I think it was, there was eight polls in Airdrie and four of them, three of them came through right away, right away. And I was like already in the top. And I was like, okay, I'm like in the top five here I think at the time and then eventually the fourth one came in and then five and six and then hours went by and the last one didn't come in and everyone's like congratulating me and my my dad he's got this text chat with all the other old mayors that retired the same night and he's like yep she won she's in and I'm like dad you can't announce that yet it's not like we still got another poll coming in he's like oh no you're fine I'm like we don't know that we can't we can't say that I won yet it's not official I think it eventually came in Oh, around 1130 at night, the final poll came in. And yes, of course, I was like in fourth place or something um, out of the out of the 19 counselors that ran or, or candidates that ran, I should say. Um, so it was it was really it was a nail biter. I wasn't mentally I hadn't clicked into the fact that even though seven of the polls came in and I was like in on every single one, like there was no close calls there. 
Um, I was like, no, we've got to wait for the last one to come in. No, <sighs> nobody call it. Because so that one poll could time. swing completely to another candidate and I could be knocked out. <laughs> I think mathematically speaking, probably <laughs> not, but you, you don't know how many people came to that poll. It was the busiest one yeah. um, of the whole city. So anyway, long story short, um, you know, that was the nail biter for me. And then it officially came through. Uh, I cried. I did cry. And uh, I like to joke and tell people that I've had my tear ducts surgically removed, but I did. I cried. I was just so relieved. I had this amazing team very small team of volunteers and enthusiasts behind me the whole time. And they worked so hard and they helped me so much. And, you know, a, a few people sort of said, well, you basically ran a mayor's campaign. Like you ran for council, but you ran a mayor's campaign. And I was like, whatever, like I usually am over the top with most things, but, um, it was, it was incredible. And it was just so touching and all in that moment. And, my dad was was there with us. He was there that night. He came the weekend before the election and he was with me late at night on Saturday and Sunday night, like shoving literature into people's front doors at, you know, 930 at night. And we have this little video where we put the last one in the last door together on Sunday night and every piece of literature we had printed out was out there in the world. And he was with me for that. Um, so it just, it all kind of came to a head on the Monday night and, uh, and I just was like, yeah, this is, this is meant to be, here we go. This is, this is the start. So the reason why I was so interested in having you on this show, on this segment is because you're a unique counselor in 2021 in the city of Airdrie, six out of the seven candidates are being reelected. You are the only counselor, including the mayor who is a new voice on this city. So yeah. you are going into a group that has four years of uh, camaraderie. They know each other, they've worked together and you're the new voice. And this is why I'm excited to have you on because I want to, I've, I've, I've wanted to ask this question to a lot of people, but you're the first. How was it coming into a established council already? Because you're going in and you're going into a, budget deliberation that this whole council has worked on but you you're going in with issues that this council already knows about and you have to catch up so for you what was that experience like over that this first year because I can imagine it's overwhelming in a good year when you have a few councillors who are just elected but you are the only one who's just elected yeah um I had no fear I don't know. I, it didn't intimidate me. I think the only thing that was hard. Were they welcoming? It, yeah. Oh yeah. Every, I will tell you, everyone is very respectful of each other. We don't always agree, um, but everyone's very respectful of each other. And I, I really appreciate that about this council. Um, and I don't know, maybe people go home and throw back a beer and say, oh, that's Spearman. Ah. Um, but, <laughs> um, but you know what? Everyone's really respectful. I think my biggest challenge coming into this was I understand, I understand the concepts. I understand what I'm here for. I understand why people voted me in. And I have a direction that I've created. I think the biggest challenge I've had since being elected is truly just that people forget that I'm new. Um, so a lot of the policies, a lot of the things that happen, um, you know, I, I always have to stop and say, hang on, why are we doing this this way? Why is this happening this way? Which has actually proven to be an incredible gift because 75, 80% of the time, the answer is, well, it's just the way we've always done it. And, <laughs> My hair lights on fire in that moment because I, oh, I do not, I do not live in that realm. I, that's a hard place for me to live. I have a hard time with that. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure I, I shook, shook some, some, I don't know, shook some feathers, ruffled some feathers um, in, in my grand entrance into city politics, but it's, um, 
that's been the biggest challenge. Sometimes even the most minute things like, oh, I guess, yeah, we never did give you an orientation on this or that thing or that. Oh, yeah, sorry, you were supposed to complete this course within the first 90 days. Uh, and now it's been eight months. Do you mind just getting this done real quick? Like, those are the things I don't pay attention to. Honestly, I'm sure I knew them somewhere in the back of my mind. But if someone doesn't say, hey, Heather, like from a logistical standpoint or from a policy standpoint or as per the MGA, you're supposed to do this, this and this, I'm not paying attention. <laughs> like, I, it's not that I'm not detail oriented. It's just that I am so busy dealing with what people are asking. I'm so busy trying to be engaged. I'm still so busy trying to educate that uh, those things, unless someone sticks it in front of my face, I, I'm not going to look for it. I'm not, I don't have, not to say I don't have time for it, but I don't, I don't have time for it unless you say, Heather, this has to get done legally, please complete this. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, no problem. <laughs> Let's do it because it's legal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, exactly. So y- you're elected in October of 2021. Um, there's a difference between being a candidate and being a counselor, because being a candidate, you have all these plans of how you want to change your community. But once you're elected, you then realize there's a weight and responsibility of using the tax dollars that the city collects in an appropriate manner. That first council meeting, was there a weight or was that moment of joy on election night then changed to, oh no, the decisions now that I make, the decisions that I'm about to dictate in council, vote on in council are going to affect my neighbors my the youth groups down the road the business leaders in this community was there a weight that you had to put on yourself to say okay i have to be responsible not only with the decisions that i make but the decisions that i make are going to affect the people that are in my community and i'm going to hear about it no really no um no and it's not because i don't feel the it's not that I don't feel the pressure. It's that I believe if you are going to enter the realm of politics, you need to stand by your beliefs. You need to be who you ran as. You need to work just as hard after being elected as you did trying to get elected. And I understand that things change. There are I've changed my opinion on on some things, like not nothing major, but some things since being elected. Um, but I will always stand by those decisions. And as long as I am using public money to make decisions, to create services, to create infrastructure, I will always do what I believe is in the um, best interest of the people that live here. And if I'm wrong, people will tell me and we will address it. But I will never take any decision I make lightly. Uh, and I and I knew that before I even got elected. So there was no change in the pressure or the weight. In fact, it was a relief to be elected because I knew at that point I could go forward with, with knowing that out of the people that elected me in Airdrie, I was in the top four because people believed in what I had to say. So now I take what I committed to and I just keep rolling with it. Um, and, and it was a huge relief that people believed in me. And I believe as a politician, if you are running with ideas and concepts and platforms that you need to stick to who you are, you need to be authentic, you need to be transparent. And if people don't like what you're running on, they won't elect you. And if you're, if you're an incumbent and you are waffling and sitting on the fence and giving non-answers, you don't deserve to be there. And I don't, and I'm not saying that to anyone in in particular, I'm saying that to anyone. So if, if I hit the next election and I choose to run again, or I choose to run in another role or whatever that is, um, I'm going to run on the things I believe are best for this city because I can't sit on council and not stay true to myself and to the things that I believe this city needs. And if I'm wrong, the voters will say that in their election choice, and then I won't be there. If I'm scraping by and I just barely get in, then I go, oh, shoot, now I need to think about what I'm getting wrong here. And then I need to work twice as hard to make sure that I'm engaged with the people of the city. So no, well, how, do you, how, do you, how do you balance that? Because 
everyone believes their opinion is the right opinion. Everyone believes that their project, their infrastructure project, whether it be a pothole in front of their house, a sidewalk that needs to be updated, a park that needs to be updated, is the most important issue to them. As counselor, how do you weigh that? Because that must be challenging because you have your set of values that you believe in when you get elected. And it seems like you're, you're, you, you've you changed your mind on a certain certain small issues, but overall you believe the path forward for you is the right path. When you're talking to constituents though, their values are the most important values and you're elected to represent them in some sense while they did vote for your beliefs their beliefs change on a daily basis because of issues that are facing them. So as counselor, how do you balance that? Because that must be, for me, it would be challenging because you, you're there to represent everyone, but you have to then pick and choose who the winners and the losers are at the end of the day when it comes to budget time. Yeah, it's true. And you know what? That's, that's especially true now that municipalities are dealing with the cuts from MSI funding and you know, obviously, we're still waiting for the LGFF to be established. Uh, so that makes things that makes things tough. And I guess, to me, you know, when I when I picked up the documentation that said this is the role of a city councilor, the thing that really jumped out to me was there's a bullet point in there that says you're making when you run for council, when you are a city councilor, your job is to represent. Um, as many of the people as you can, but making the best decision for people as a whole. So as an example, let's let's talk about um, you know, the unhoused population. Airdrie has has a growing number of people who are unhoused. And it is not the majority of the population, but it is critical that we provide those people with basic needs that we make sure that they have healthcare, mental health, four walls and food and potentially transportation to get around. And again, not necessarily a city purview, but here we are. Um, we certainly help facilitate some of those organizations that have the programming to help that. So no, they're not the majority of the people, but if we ignore that, what happens to that issue? What happens to those people? and ignoring those people and not helping them get their needs met, not giving them a hand up. We're not talking handouts. We're not saying like, here, throw $20,000 at them and see what happens. We're talking like, how do we give them a hand up so that they can get to the next step in their life so that they can start helping themselves more and helping themselves more, right? And families doing the same. So no, they're not the majority of people, but if we ignore that issue, if we don't step up, and take charge and help these people, how is that going to affect the greater good, right? It's going to cause greater crime. It's going to create, um, you know, more issues. If you're trying to have a nice picnic in the park and, you know, somebody's over there and unfortunately they've overdosed on fentanyl or something and now the fire truck is here and, you know, and then all of a sudden costs to the municipality increase, right? Because suddenly we're having to find, you know, overdose programs and and mental health programs. And, and so, you know, it's a lot of people don't think about the complexities of these very small issues, but to me, there are certain issues, particularly around social programming, where people's needs have to be met. They have to be. So in that realm, I mean, that's one example. Yes, it's a small minority of, of the people that live here, but they are still part of our population. They're still part of the community and they still matter. Um, and if we take care of them, that takes care of issues for a lot of people in the city. On the other end of the spectrum, Getting another rec center in Airdrie is massive. It's a really important thing. It's several years away in terms of the actual construction and opening the doors. But we know just from common sense that with 80,000 people plus the surrounding communities, plus the North Calgary folks that are coming up and using our facilities, that one swimming pool is not enough. So we know <laughs> we need to make a decision, even though maybe grandpa doesn't need swimming lessons, and, you know, someone else does. And when we take care of a bunch of people, that helps everybody else. And I, I think for me, um, that's just part of my moral compass and my decision making. And that's what makes it so easy sometimes to say, you know what, yes, we do need to make some of this budget focus on that rec center that's opening in 2020. Well, right now it's 2029. We'll see about that. But um you know, do you know what I mean? I, I know I'm kind of going off on a tangent here, but I, I think that 
when you use common sense, when you think of the long-term effects, when you think of the vision of the city, when you think of what is going to be good for everybody in the greater picture, that makes these decisions easier. And it sure makes it easier for me to explain why I vote the way I do on certain topics, because I will never vote on something without knowing that the value I'm bringing to that decision is something that I will be willing to stand by. It doesn't mean that I'm always right. Not at all. I don't think that I am. I'm still human. I still make mistakes. Um, and I will always own those mistakes. I always will. I won't deny them. Uh, anyone can call me out on them. And I tell people that all the time. Uh, and I'll do it openly. I'll do it in public. So I, I want to turn to one last uh, comment, uh, question in this segment, then we're going to turn to the city of Airdrie in, as a whole. Um, I, I'm just cautious of time here, uh, but I, I, if you have an extra few minutes, we'll go a little bit longer if that's okay with you. I got time. I just don't want to hog your podcast. So. Uh, hey, no, I love I love these conversations. I love when we there's an informal conversation. Um, but I want to talk about the personal and public life of a politician because municipal politicians are the frontline politics of uh well, they're the frontline politics of all politics because you will go to your grocery store and people will know who you are. In smaller rural communities, they might know you a little bit more, but in even in the city of Airdrie, you might get stopped on a regular basis, unlike your MLA or your MP, because they're not always there and they're always coming and going. But you, you can go from your council meeting to your grocery store one night and be asked a question on certain issues. How have you been able to adapt to that living standard of now being in the public, but also trying to have a private life as well? Has it been challenging or have you been able to adapt over the last year into the role of a counselor for a city? And you now realize that if you go to your local grocery store, you may be stopped on a regular basis or on a, on a semi-regular basis and asked, Why'd you vote this way? Or why, what, what's your opinion on this issue? And why can we, when can we get a park fixed in this area? How has it been to adapt to that new lifestyle? <laughs> <laughs> Tongue in cheek. Uh, the, <laughs> the blessing of people not being engaged in local government is that it's quite rare <laughs> that that happens. Really? At the grocery store. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, I'm not. For example, Councillor Ron Chapman has lived in Airdrie since 1978, and he has been on council just as long as our mayor has. So he will likely get stopped out and about where he is because he's just been on council for so long. And, you know, his voting demographic are the people that will stop him in the grocery store. My voting demographic half the time orders their groceries to home, uh, myself included, depending on how crazy my week is. Um, but, uh, you know, all, all chuckles aside, when I ran, one of my goals was to make politics approachable. I want to see more moms and dads run in politics. I want you all to see that you can go out to the events and you can bring your kids and you can still be a person and this can be a family affair. I, I believe that if I'm you know, trying to put a wall between being a counselor and being a family person, for me, it's just not realistic. And honestly, I think it creates a bit of a fallacy in terms of who can do this job. I want to have moms and dads doing this job. I want them to see that this can be done, that you can go out to the grocery store with your family and um, go out to an event with your family and, and it's normalized. And I, I'm almost at the point where I'd like to see potential childcare at some of these council meetings, not just for um, the people that want to attend to be a part of, of a discussion, but, but for counselors too. I mean, we've seen politicians all over the world having babies like a week after they get elected into their role. And it's like, heck yes, more of this, please. So um, have I had an issue with that balance? I, I don't think that's the balance I've had an issue with. I have no problem being who I am. Obviously, I don't tell people where my kids go to school and I don't put their faces in my um, social media posts just for that aspect of safety. I mean, we were they real? Do your kids realize that mom's counselor now? Do they do they understand that mom <laughs> might be stopped from time to time or mom might show up at my school as an elected official to give a speech at Remembrance Day or their graduation? <laughs> it's uh, that's hilarious that you say that. My two youngest, so I have three boys, and my two youngest like love every time I go to an event because most of the events that we do outside 
are at one of our like big regional parks in town and there's a couple of playgrounds and there's the rainbow pathway and there's a stage and there's always food trucks so they're like yes can we get mini donuts let's go and then they just like run and go and play the whole time so awesome we had um on friday like September 30th, we had uh, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, and it was amazing. Like, we had a whole bunch of people here from Treaty 7 and uh, Métis Region 3, and we're cooking, like, bannock over the open fire. And my youngest, oh, man, the bannock was, like, his new love language. He was all for it. So we're roasting it, and he's running around eating it. Like, and I'm there as an elected official in theory, but I'm also there as a mom, and, you know, they just loved it. Meanwhile, my my high schooler, my oldest, um, he being a high school student, I can imagine what that's like. <laughs> well, he's real touch and go on this one. I'll tell you because some days he's like, mom, like, when are you going to tell people like you're a counselor? And I'm like, people know I'm a counselor. It's, it's normal. And he's like, yeah, well, if I was the counselor, like I'd just be flexing all the time. And I'm like, okay, he, he's not quite locked in on like, what the privileges of being a counselor can be versus what they should not be. So he's just like, well, you should do this. Like, that's what I do if I was counselor. I'm like, thank you for your 14 year old perspective on that. Uh, on the other side of things. So on one hand, he's like super proud, like all his friends know. Uh, but on the other side of things, like he's got this um, field trip to the Alberta legislature coming up. And of course we get the message that's like, who's coming to volunteer as a parent? And I'm like, Alberta <laughs> legislature. And I'm on my phone and I'm like, heck yes, I'll be the first one there. Like, where do I sign up? And then a few days later, I'm like, guess what? By the way, like I'm coming with you guys. He's like, no, mom, don't come. I'm like, out of all of your field trips, like this is the one I should be coming to. Like I can give you guys like a whole bunch of information on the way back and on the way there. Like I spent lots of time there. And he's like, no, please don't come. I'm like, well, too late. To <laughs> <laughs> the great thing about so many parents being so busy is that now I can be like, oh, well, sorry, no other parents could come. So I have to. Sorry, 14 year old. I want to turn to my <laughs> second segment now, counselor. And before we start this segment, I want to preface this uh, conversation, this part of the conversation with this. This is a conversation between Councillor Spearman and myself. This is not a, uh, the, this is not an opinion of the full council. This is not a, uh, a, a, a motion by the council. This is just an opinion from Councillor Spearman and talking to the host of the cross-border interviews. And the reason I say that is because We've already had one person send a message to us in our first week of the show of the series saying, well, why is this council deb uh, debating this issue? And I said, no, it's an opinion based on the counselor's statement. So counselor, in your opinion, and this is your opinion, not the opinion of counselor or the motion of counsel, what is the biggest issue facing the city of Airdrie today? It's healthcare, man. It's healthcare. Um, and I know, I know it's not a municipal issue, but, in but isn't it though? A municipal issue. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for saying that because everybody is like, no, it's not our lane. It is our lane. And here's why. Uh, I have a lot of, <laughs> sorry, gather around children. Um, <laughs> I'm coming. Let's sit around yeah. the fire and listen. I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh gosh. It is. It's a debacle. Hold on. Sorry. Of course, as I'm getting really excited, my laptop decides it wants to die. Um, okay. So here's the deal. As I mentioned earlier, I was feeling like our province was on fire. So I have um, some disabilities and, and one of them is uh, really reliant on immunotherapy drugs. And actually two of them are, but, but it is life and death for me. And there are many people in this province who also need that kind of care. So um there was a whole span of time where the provincial government was going to eliminate funding the actual immunosuppressant drugs that so many people with specific autoimmune issues, including rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's and colitis and all those things were reliant on. Well, hello. This is your friendly host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with Strategic Steps Incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work 
is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments, and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the new show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into The Political Trenches. I approached my family and I said, listen, with these autoimmune therapy drugs, if you go off of them, you can't get back on, you build up, um, you know, antibodies. And I said, please, 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 for the love of all things holy and good, this is life and death. People die from these diseases if they are not properly medicated. I said, please, please, please don't let the government do this. And I had benefits. I work full time. My husband works full time. We're covered. But it doesn't mean that other people in this province don't need that help. And this this was before the pandemic got crazy. Um, so we already were starting to experience healthcare crises long before the pandemic came along in this province. Um, and I didn't hear back and I didn't hear back and I didn't hear back. I CC'd in, of course, the critic for health um, and the leader of the opposition and didn't hear back, didn't hear back. And then eventually a few months later, I get this boilerplate, like, thanks for your message. Like it had already passed. It was done. Um, and I guess the reason why I explain that is because there is so much going sideways in the healthcare realm in our province that as a municipality, we have to, people don't feel heard. That's the number one thing that I hear from people when they're talking about healthcare in Airdrie is they're not feeling heard. They don't understand why we had all these closures in our urgent care. They don't understand why the province makes these healthcare decisions and why we as a city are not yelling at them. Um, and, and advocating on behalf of citizens to the province and why our ambulance waits are so terrible and why our ambulances get caught in Calgary all the time and why our EMS is burnt out. We have tons of frontline workers and EMS workers here in Airdrie. We have an urgent care that healthcare workers don't want to come and work at because the state of this urgent care is a disaster physically like there's duct tape holding styrofoam together to make rooms shower pardon me shower curtains as curtains mops in the corner of a treatment room and and so many other things and I'm not saying something that you wouldn't know like if you went to urgent care right now and walked in the building and got put in the back you would see all these things I'm not sharing like secret information this is what it is and these poor nurses and doctors and and staff that are working at urgent care are burnt out and they're not supported. And we've had to raise hell to get health care here. And it was only a few years ago that we got overnight health care here. And we have 80,000 people. We probably serve closer to 120, 130,000 people at that urgent care because people in Calgary go, oh, I don't want to wait at our hospital. I'm going to drive up to Airdrie. Cochrane's urgent care closes at 10 p.m. So after 10 o'clock, guess where Cochrane comes for health healthcare? It's a disaster. Where I see City of Airdrie potentially helping, and this is Heather, not City of Airdrie, not Council. We have not had these discussions. This is where I stand. I say, in a perfect world, we do a crazy economic development push where we create the best reasons for doctors and nurses to wanna to live here and open businesses here. Because if I went to school as a medical professional, the last thing on my mind would be running a business. But if we can create incentives for them to open walk-in clinics here, to take some of that burden off of urgent care, incentives for more family doctors to be here so that they want to be here and service the families that are here. Because as per the beginning of our conversation, Airdrie has a very young average age, tons of families, not enough doctors to service those families. Um, so that's what I see. I see like, honestly, if I could find some doctors and specialists, if we could have a bit of a healthcare campus where people could come and get their dialysis done, their IV treatments done. I go into Calgary for, I would say, 100% of my healthcare I have to go into Calgary for just because of the nature of the beast. And I'm not expecting that we're going to have you know, hepatologists and oncologists in, in Airdrie per se, but we birth 900 to 1,000 babies a year in this city. So why are we not having a birthing center here? Like some of these things are just like economic development that we could be doing. I'm not saying our economic development at the city isn't phenomenal because they are insane with what they do with like how little staff they have. Like even if they had twice as much staff, I'd still say they're unbelievable. Um, 
but that's where my brain goes. Do you think it's I a say, blessing and curse? Sorry to interrupt. Do you think it's a blessing no. and a curse that Airdrie is located so close to Calgary that maybe the provincial and federal governments are going, well, they can drive 10 minutes down the road to Calgary if they're really in hard shape uh, for health wise. And I, and I'm saying that with all due respect to the people of Airdrie, know. because I believe healthcare should be one of these priorities that any government should be focusing on right now after the last few years that we've just gone through. Um, but being so close to the city of Calgary, I, I, I not to burst your bubble here, counselor, but you you want a birthing center. The province is going to go, well, you have Calgary right down the road and they have one. So why should you get one as well when other rural municipalities are facing the same crisis and we have to deal with that as well? You are not bursting my bubble. I'm <laughs> laughing because I hear this all the time, all the time. But here's what I'll say to that because I'm spicy on this topic. As you can already tell. Uh, all right, here's the deal. I grew up in Lethbridge, right? Lethbridge had a couple hospitals in the 80s and 90s. Um, now they have the one regional hospital, but they they also struggle with attracting doctors and, and whatnot. But here's the thing, when I was in Lethbridge, I was still directed towards Calgary. It's not a, um, what goes sideways for me in this province is that it's not just Airdrie that's directed to Calgary. It's everybody that doesn't live in Calgary or Edmonton is directed to these places. If you need some kind of like specialist, if you need anything beyond a family doctor, that's where you're getting directed anyway. Um, this is a non, it's, it's not a, it's not good. Yeah, whatever. I'm going to say it. it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Um, I think we need to spread the, the healthcare coverage out. We need to spend way more money on the right staff for healthcare in, in, well, in, energy too, uh, in Alberta. Um, we're kind of kneecapping some of our, our medical professionals, right? And when it comes to energy specifically to your point of why don't they just go to Calgary? We've been told that for years, but here's the thing. Calgary is coming up on hitting 2 million people. They don't have room for Airdrie to come and get their supports because they can barely hold up what they have as it is, as it is. Like for me to go into Calgary and get medical care, um, I'm waiting months at a time. I, I have some very specific health issues that I have to get MRIs and I have to get blood tests and I have to get infusions and I have to get all these different things throughout the year on a very regular schedule. And if I don't, I got problems. And so I get to be in that privileged space. But if you are just coming into a new medical diagnosis, you could be waiting 18, 24 months, maybe worse now. I'm not sure, but it's it's not good. Calgary's already at max capacity. We need to start creating our own made in energy solutions. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not expecting that we're going to have our own, you know, world-class specialists in Airdrie. We don't have health secondary programs feeding into, you know, our, our campuses or our healthcare campuses, but we could at least take off some of that, that burden from Calgary and, and create that for people that are here in Airdrie and especially just walk-in clinics, like a very basic thing that we really don't have. We have a few family physicians that happen to have walk-in hours, but if you called one right now and said, can I get in today or tomorrow? They would say, no, we're full come back in a week I, I, it goes back to this educational piece that you talked about earlier on in the episode about residents don't care at the end of the day what issue is provincial federal or municipal they want it fixed by their elected official because that's what they've put you there to do yeah. And you'll be the first to admit, and I think I'm I, I, I am not bursting anyone's uh, uh, knowledge here that even though it may not look like the city of Airdrie is doing things on the file, there is back backroom discussions happening between officials at the government of Alberta, the officials at Canada Health, and this is ongoing. So while it may not look like there is uh, progress on the file, you're still working on it. May not just be the glamoury, glamorous photo op that people are expecting all the time of a new health file or a new healthcare facility opening. Correct. Correct. It is ongoing. I mean, here in Airdrie, we have something called the Airdrie Health Foundation, um, and they have been probably the biggest at consistent advocates because governments come and go. Um, the way it came to be was an absolute tragedy, but it is here, and it has changed the face of Airdrie. It was the number one reason we got overnight care in the first place at Urgent Care. 
So I will forever, forever be grateful to the Airdrie Health Foundation and shameless plug for them. If people are looking for an organization to donate to or support, that is the one because there are things that have been installed, um, staff that have been trained, programs that have been put in place um, at our urgent care solely because of the Airdrie Health Foundation advocating to the government. Um, and if they hadn't done that, those things would never be in Airdrie, never. So they they are a big part of that. Um, and they are a big part of some of those backdoor discussions. I'll be honest, I don't get included on a lot of those healthcare discussions because probably because I'm a loud mouth. And the last time I was included in one of them, I called a media presser with uh, Mayor Gondek and we raised a bit of a stink and it wasn't very well appreciated at the provincial level. But Funny enough, a week or so later, our our closures went away at urgent care. So sometimes you have sometimes you have to do that though. Sometimes you have to raise a little hell mm-hmm. to get things done municipally. Correct. It happens, and I'm I'm not saying it was thanks to me. I'm not saying that at all. I am not, but um, definitely it was it was interesting that it wasn't until we were a squeaky wheel that magically some changes happened. So here we are. Um, I want to. I want. I want you to put on your hypothetical hat right now, and that is hypothetically, if tomorrow morning the healthcare crisis in Airdrie was fixed, fixed like that, mm-hmm. everything that you want, everything that you just talked about was given to the city of Airdrie, and it was built overnight. What would be the next priority for you as councillor to fix? What is there a municipal issue that is on your radar that you want to tackle over the next three years of your term? I think the overarching issue is that we are just growing so fast. We are tra- we are on a trajectory to be the uh, third largest city uh, within probably the next 10 years. So we will surpass Red Deer and we will surpass Lethbridge. Um, keeping up with everything that is needed in a young city such as ours at the, at the speed with which it grows is our greatest challenge. I cannot solve that in three years, but what is important to me, maybe this comes from my professional background where everything needs to be measured and there are metrics and there's accountability, but part of that for me is creating urgency. I think that's big for me. I feel like there are some things that are unavoidable in terms of process and decisions. I can't run into AB Ledge and start yelling at people and all of a sudden it's going to be done. It's just not how it works. Your son might Uh, like that. (laughs) <laughs> well, we'll see. Looking forward to the field trip day. Um, <laughs> he's going to wear a paper bag over his head for the rest of the year. Uh, and it's only October, so that'll be fun for me to see. Anyway, um, but I think I think from an internal level, sometimes we allow process to get in the way and we allow, um, I don't want to say feelings, because I have feelings. I promise I do. I really, in fact, I probably really do, but um, sometimes, you know, we're worried about the wrong things. And I feel like, you know, here we have this rec center that's desperately needed. And, and it is desperately needed. I know for some people, they'll say that's a nice to have, but we have 80,000 people. And like I said, plus the surrounding communities, and we have one swimming pool and kids that can't get into swimming lessons. And um, even folks that are getting their rec passes um, as a subsidy, like for them, that's mental health and physical health, and that's a hand up, right? And and even they can't get into the facility sometimes. So what's the point of trying to give everybody a hand up if we don't have things in place to support them? We've got big, big infrastructure things going on um, that need to be addressed, um, and we just we just need to move faster. We just need to move faster. And I know a lot of people are probably laughing and saying, oh, what a new counselor thing to say. But but there are some conversations I've sat in on where I have wanted to bash my head against the wall because I'm like, there's no point. There's no point. We're, we're getting in our own way sometimes. So for me, that's a big obstacle that I really want to change that sentiment. And I will say, uh, we hired a new city manager in Airdrie. Uh, he started on August 29th. And our previous one was lovely and awesome and a wonderful friend. And he was very good at what he did. But we are now in a new era. And that is where I believe our new CAO is really going to bring some hot potatoes to the table. 
Um, he is very good. He, he understands getting things done while also understanding the policies. And he sees that sense of urgency that we have. And he is, he is really going to help us usher in that new era over the next bunch of years and certainly over the next three years uh, for the remainder of this term. Strategic Steps works with local municipalities, boards, and school divisions across Canada, providing guidance and expertise in governance, strategy, and sustainability. They work with clients to build on existing strengths, develop recommendations that are practical, sustainable, and strategic, and lead professional development sessions that drive organizational excellence and council and board member growth. From strategic planning to organizational and governance reviews to governance workshops and more, Strategic Steps has the tools, experience, and expertise to help your organization reach its goals and set itself up for future success. To book a consultation or learn more about Strategic Steps Incorporated, visit strategicsteps.ca today. Um, <clears throat> I want to turn to the last segment because I am cautious of time here. And this is the fun segment for me. While policy is the geeky stuff that I love and I love talking about it and love hearing about the issues that are facing communities, I love talking about tourism as well. Why people should visit your community. So, counselor. Are the hidden gems for my listeners and viewers that they need to stop at? They need to visit while visiting the city of Airdrie, in your opinion. Airdrie is a lot of great things, but I will tell you that if you are looking to spend a weekend somewhere, here's what you're going to do you are going to grab a room, uh, let's say at our local uh, Ramada Inn, because we will swimming pool and hot tub. You're going to stay there, you're going to grab an e scooter. And uh, on Saturday morning, you're going to rip over to Abe's Diner for an amazing brunch. And um, after that, you and your friends on your e-scooters are going to go on the Airdrie Ale Trail, which is four incredible breweries, all local microbrews. And you're going to go from brewery to brewery, and you're going to have samples, and then you are going to end up at one of our local haunts for some live music. Uh, sometimes it's open mic, sometimes it's classical music, sometimes it's rock bands, country singers. Uh, the one thing that people don't know about Airdrie is that we have an incredible roster of musicians that are world class, winning awards all over the freaking place. And they are out and about all the time. And I just want people to know how absolutely rich in culture and rich in food and culinary and beverage talent we are. We have a, um, a place here called Sorso Lounge and they won the best Caesar in Canada several years in a row. So I don't know, if it were me and I liked music and delicious food and delicious drinks, that's where I'd be spending my weekend, just saying. So on, on that note, where you'll be spending your weekend, I want to ask, after a stressful day, as for after a long day, maybe at council meetings, maybe at budget deliberations, what's the one place in the city of Airdrie that you can go to to decompress? Is there a park? Is there a walking trail? What is the special spot of Airdrie that you enjoy going to to go just decompress and just escape from the world for a few minutes? Um, <laughs> well, I will say this. Airdrie has over 140 kilometers of pathways and they are gorgeous. So while we are relatively flat in nature, um, we are an amazing place to like go for a run. Uh, full disclosure, I have not been in the running mindset for a couple of years, but I used to train for half marathons and I really loved running our trails because they're really amazing in that sense. Um, now, honestly, when I get downtime, I just want to like hide in with my family and binge watch a show. And it's not that I don't want to do it in Airdrie. It's just that I love Airdrie so much that I am out in Airdrie every day. So coming home and just being at home is really nice. Um, but I will say that I really enjoy, uh, the random karaoke night. We've got about five places in town where I can do that if I just want to let my hair down and Counselor, myself. you and I need to go karaoke. I am putting that out there right now. Whatever the next one's coming up, I will be up there to sing Don't Stop Believing or some Frozen song. <laughs> <laughs> 
Amazing. All uh, right. You sold me. I'm in. Correct me if I'm wrong here. And I, I think I am. Is there a walking trail that connects the city of Calgary to the city of Airdrie or no? Uh, not safely, but that is in the works. There is a actually a biking trail that's going to be a walking trail. There are pathways, but they, they're they not quite connected yet. It kind of goes all around Airdrie. And then there's stuff in Rocky View, kind of near Cross Iron. And then there's stuff on the north end, like Nose Creek Park. Uh, not Nose uh, Creek Park, but Nose Creek end of Calgary. Yeah. So it's almost together. There is a process coming in. Uh, that is going to connect a bike and walking path between the two. And that is going to be every bike commuter's dream. And I cannot wait for that, but not quite there yet. Okay. My last question to you, counselor, and this is the one that you can take some time and think about if you want, or if you, if you already know why you can just answer it right away. What makes the city of Airdrie such a unique place to live, work and play? Mm, I love that question. And I, I know you asked all these questions to the other guests you've had, and I didn't want to like premeditate on any of them. So now I really do have to think about this one. Um, Okay, so what makes it a unique place to work, live, and play? You know, we are going to get there with a lot of this healthcare stuff. We're going to get there. I am very confident that we are going to get there. So when you take away that stressor, Airdrie is an incredible place to live. We're relatively affordable by comparison to Calgary and Edmonton. We are growing in our arts and culture all the time. I I have to say that the last six months I have seen Airdrie's arts and culture seem just explode, um, which is incredible. Our food is incredible. But what is really unique about Airdrie is how people underestimate us um what do you mean by always that? Think that well I, I mean it in so many different ways but as in a nutshell Airdrie is underestimated people think we're smaller than we are a lot of, like even ministers in the provincial government shockingly when we're like we're 80,000 people they're like oh why are we like 30,000 I'm like no that's Okotoks man um no, we're 80. Not that there's people. anything wrong with Okotoks. Oh, I love Okotoks. Some of the people on council there are literally my my greatest <laughs> friends right now. Man, I, I love Tanya and I love uh, Rachel and Oliver. They're all amazing. Love Okotoks actually so much. But um, but population wise, right? So we're we're 80,000 people. People often think we're smaller than we are. When you look at the actual people that are here, we have some of the most unbelievable professional and cultural talent on the planet on the planet and I mean that wholeheartedly like the original like the guy who started WestJet I won't drop his name the guy who started WestJet lives in Airdrie the lady who started Triple Flip lives in Airdrie the VP of Taco Time lives in Airdrie Um, From a cultural standpoint, we have these internationally renowned artists, we're internationally renowned photographers who have their work displayed like in San Francisco art galleries and across Europe. We've got musicians who have toured the planet, who have CDs out. Like the people in Airdrie are nuts. Like, and I don't mean it in a mental health way. I mean it in like a, the talent and knowledge and resumes of the people who live here are unbelievable. It is legitimately a goal of mine to do some kind of humans of New York style book where we talk about the unbelievable people that live here. Like, so when I say we're underestimated, I mean, people underestimate how incredible we are from a talent standpoint, knowledge standpoint, size standpoint, and what we're capable of. And the thing I love the most about Airdrie, hands down, and the people that live here is that anytime somebody hits a crisis, like there was a kid who wanted to get like this special equipment. He, um, he was sort of wheelchair bound and he wanted special equipment. And like within like a week, everyone in Airdrie like band together and just like fundraise the crap out of getting him everything he needed to be like some, some sort of like BMX whiz. And, um, we have stuff like that. Anytime somebody has got a crisis, like the community just rallies as if it's like a 200 person community, but it's so random and amazing. So, um, you know, if I, if I could put a catchphrase on air it would just be like, don't underestimate me. Like, this is Airdrie. We are um, we are so much more than anybody ever realizes. This one just drives right past us on the way to Edmonton or Red Deer. But man, we are 
We are unbelievable here. And I am so blessed to live here. I'm so honored to know the people I know. And um, just the generosity of spirit here is everything. I will always say that Airdrie has some of the best yard sales as well. As a yard sailor who loves going out and yard sailing, I will always come up to Airdrie to go yard sailing just because there's always that unique find up there. Man, we are going yard sailing and then we're going to karaoke and <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. We're Done. Be locking this down. <laughs> um, <laughs> Counselor Spearman, this has been a blast. We have talked and it does not feel like an hour. To be honest, it feels like 10 minutes and time has just flown by. But I could not have asked for a better way to end week two of Municipal Month on the Cross Border Interview. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. and. Um, yeah, such a treat. And again, thank you so much for having all of these amazing local politicians on your on your podcast. I, I can't love that enough. And I can't love that you're just getting the word out and helping maybe people discover and see themselves in local politics going forward. I, I think it's amazing. So uh, rock on for doing that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, to my listeners, this has been the end of week two. Week three starts on Monday. And with that, we will have, and I want to make sure I, I, I pulled it up while you were speaking, the village of Torquay, Saskatchewan's mayor, Mike Strathcan, is going to be with us to talk about his village, Saskatchewan politics. So please tune in on Monday. And I also want to say, as I say at the end of all my episodes, put down your social media feed. Put down Twitter, put down Facebook, put down Instagram and go have a conversation with somebody. Helps our society, helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Thank you.